So friends, I actually, there, I mean, but this, Satya, this sir. yeah, they're waiting. They will get joined. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. This oh, particular oh, session you, is a session. Go ahead with session this. Session. After that, our session. Thank yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I think they have to mute. Otherwise, uh, there will be a problem. Okay. Now, uh, this is a very special session, and uh, I would uh, say that this is the first time that in India we are very seriously discussing a new concept called neuro rights. This uh, Dr. Rafael Uste is a professor of biological sciences and neuroscience and uh, who invented the atom bomb. The scientist who invented the atom bomb who did not know uh, how it will be misused and uh, today sometimes people say scientists actually created a monster. Now this person as a neuroscience um, specialist has identified that while neuroscience is beneficial for various health purposes, we need to think of regulating the use of neuroscience. And that is why he is advocating the neuro rights. And uh, his arguments have been uh, actually accepted by at least one country, which is the Chile, which has already brought in the neuro rights law in some way, and has considered that it should be part of a human rights uh, kind of a thing, universal human uh, right. And uh, he is uh, perhaps will, uh, in the days to come, will be considered the father of neuro rights uh, in the world. Okay, so at least in India, we should try to take some steps ahead. So I have been looking at uh, neuro rights um, in India, particularly because we now are in a cusp where a new law is being done, and by adding a few explanations, maybe we will perhaps be uh, having a reasonable uh, coverage of neuro rights. Uh, even in India. I am going to have a separate session on this on day three, but today, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Uste, who is a person who has even been awarded uh, some lot of, uh, I mean, awards are there, and definitely he has uh, achieved so many things uh, in an area which nobody else uh, had addressed. And um, we are very happy that when I contacted him, he uh, agreed. Of course, uh, time difference was like that. Now, right now, it will be middle of the night uh, in his place. And uh, I suggested to him that he can record the video and send it. He has taken the trouble of uh, recording a uh, 30 minutes uh, video. And uh, let us assume that he is virtually present here and listen to this uh, video. Thereafter, we will start uh, the uh, awards function. Okay. Right, right, right. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Sadiq, kindly go ahead. Yeah, great, thank you. Hello, my name is Rafael Juste. I'm a professor of neuroscience at Columbia University in New York, and I'm also the director of the Neurotechnology Center at Columbia. So I'm talking to you from my office at Columbia, and you have my old uh, microscope over here. And right behind me, there is a building uh, which is a, a national monument. And this building is called Pupin Hall. And the reason it's a national monument is because in the basement of this building, in the 1940s, they built the first atomic reactor in the world. And the group of physicists who built this reactor built the atomic bomb. This was the Manhattan Project, and it was called Manhattan because it started right here in Manhattan, although they later took it to the desert in Los Alamos in New Mexico. And what I'd like to mention to you is that the same physicists that created the atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project, were the first ones to argue for international regulation of atomic energy. In, in Thanks to their advocacy, the United Nations created the Atomic Energy Commission in Vienna, which has regulated the use of atomic energy for peace and warfare since then without crossing fingers, without any mistakes. And this illustrates the point of my lecture, which is that science is neutral. Uh, technology is neutral. You can build things to do good or bad. There's no uh, use that is actually intrinsic with it. No? And it's this responsibility of the scientists and technologists who build these methods to ensure that their inventions are used for the good of mankind. 
So I'm going to be talking to you about an another atomic energy moment uh, which is coming our way and that has to do with neurotechnology. Let me first define what is neurotechnology. So neurotechnology uh, are methods that could be optical or electrical or based on nanophysics or chemical or acoustical or magnetic to do two things. These devices can do two things. They can either record the activity of neurons in the brain, or they can change the activity of neurons in the brain. So why is neurotechnology important? Why should we care about neurotechnology? Well, it turns out that the brain is not just another organ. It happens to be the organ that generates all of the mental and cognitive abilities of humans. I'm talking about everything that we are, our thoughts, our memories, our imaginations, our emotions, our behaviors, even our subconscious. All of that doesn't come out of thin air, but it's generated by the activity of these vast networks of neurons that we have inside our skull, or also in, in, the, in the spinal cord. And this is what uh, we call the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. And we have about 100 billion neurons inside our, our skull. No? And uh, this is an astronomical number of neurons and they're connected through also a very large um, astronomical numbers of connections uh, to the point that everyone of our brains probably has three times more nodes, connections, than the entire internet of the earth. No? So out of this internet, three internets that we have inside our skull, which by the way, consumes almost no energy, it, it's powered by the equivalent of about a 20 watt uh, bulb. No? Out of that comes all these mental and cognitive abilities. No? So because of that, the neurotechnology is critically important for three reasons. One, because using neurotechnology will be able to go in as scientists and decipher how the activity of these neurons generate our mental activity, how it generates our minds. And by doing that, we'll understand ourselves for the first time scientifically. This is gonna be a turning point in history, like a, a new renaissance or will finally understand what it's what it what does it mean to be human? What is a human being? The second reason why new technology is very important has to do with the clinic. As you know from personal experience with family members or friends, no, brain diseases have essentially no cure. I'm talking about diseases like schizophrenia, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, epilepsy, Parkinson, the uh, dementia, depression, um, mental handicap, uh, paralysis, uh, you name it. With very few exceptions, um, all these diseases are actually untouched by modern medicine. In spite of the heroic efforts of psychiatrists and neurologists, the only thing we can do with these patients is, is, is palliative care. No? And the reason is because we don't understand how the organ works. So we cannot really fix the machine if we don't understand how it works. So neurotechnology could be critical to enable clinicians to go into these uh, brains of uh, deceased uh, humans or patients, figure out what's wrong and fix them in a, in a targeted fashion. And the third reason why neurotechnology is important has to do with the, the economy. As I told you, we have like three internets up here and they can compute all kinds of problems that even the best uh, computers uh, cannot solve. In spite of the great advances of AI, we have natural AI going up here. No? So it's very likely that evolution has found algorithms and ways to compute which are much more powerful than the ones that we have implemented in digital computers. So if we can understand these algorithms with neurotechnology, we'll be able to actually revolutionize uh, modern technology and, and AI, you know, based on, on natural <laughs> algorithms as opposed to artificial algorithms. So um, 
so this tells you uh, we've discussed what is new technology why is it important so let me ask uh, why now why should we worry now about new technology and now in the past or in the future well this has to do with uh, president obama who in 2013 launched the u.s brain initiative which is a large-scale project which today funds uh, about 550 laboratories in the U.S. and around the world with a budget of approximately a billion dollars a year. No? And this is a project that's supposed to last 12 years. And the purpose of this project is to develop neurotechnology. And President Obama launched it because of these three reasons, scientifically, medically, and economically. In fact, uh, the key argument he made in his um, State of the Union address in February 2013 was the economic one. He convinced Congress that uh, this uh, investment in novel technologies, in new technology, in these devices could actually open up a new avenue of uh, benefit for the economy in the in the future, just like it happened with the Human Genome Project. So it turns out that the U.S. is not alone. Uh, the U.S. Brain Initiative has inspired similar initiatives throughout the world, including Japan, including uh, China, Australia, South Korea, uh, Israel, Canada, and the European Union. And all of these um, brain initiatives were harnessed together in a declaration in 2017 when we formed the International Brain Initiative. So just like it happened with the Human Genome Project, in which different countries had their own Human Genome Project and they all came together in an interna international project, the same thing has happened with these brain initiatives. No, each country is developing new technology for all these reasons, and they're now all united in this international brain initiative. So this is fantastic news. And on top of these investments coming from governments, there is also very significant investments coming from the private industry. In the last year, we estimated that in the U.S., the tech companies were investing three times more uh, funding in the development of new technology than the U.S. Brain Initiative. So now what we're talking about the private and public partnership in terms of developing these methods, which are going to be revolutionary. They're going to generate a new renaissance for our species uh, that help us with these uh, brain diseases and also generate a bonanza for the economy. So this is all wonderful. And people like myself, we've worked on this my uh, our whole lives, are, are ecstatic that the world finally has uh, understood the importance of new technology. Uh, but there's also issues uh, with new technology that uh, just like our colleagues in the atomic energy era, we have to alert society. Uh, these technologies are neutral. So this ability to go into the brain and record brain activity and the ability to change brain activity, by definition, since the brain generates the mind, will allow to record mental activity and to change or manipulate mental activity. Okay, so this is implicit. It goes hand, hand with hand with this technology, the great power can be good, can be used for medicine, for the economy, for science, or it can be used to uh, essentially extract uh, mental activity from people and alter that. Now, how close are we to these scenarios? Well, uh, I should mention there's two types of new technology. There is invasive new technology that requires neurosurgery, okay, and it's very powerful, where you put these devices inside the brain. And there's non-invasive new technology, which you can wear like a helmet, no? as if we're like a, like a hat, a helmet, the glasses, a diadem, or a bracelet. And that's less powerful because it doesn't directly contact the brain. Let me just give you a few examples of what we can do today with invasive and non-invasive new technology. So invasive new technology is very powerful. And with invasive new technology in, in human patients, that are, for instance, paralyzed and they cannot uh, talk. Uh, some colleagues of us have uh, used intracranial neurotechnology to decode speech and enable people to uh, to essentially uh, synthesize speeches based on their thinking. No? 
and this is revolutionary for patients that have like a lock-in syndrome. You can actually connect them to the to the outside world. Um, also with uh, uh, neural stimulators, um, like deep brain stimulators, um, doctors now, thousands of patients around the world, tens of thousands really of patients around the world use deep brain stimulation to alleviate symptoms related to Parkinson and to severe depression and even for addiction in some cases. No? As I told you, we don't understand the brain to be able to cure these diseases, but at least we can make their symptoms uh, less uh, dire. No? So these are examples of uh, the power of, uh, of uh, intracranial invasive neurotechnology. So you can record uh, and decode uh, speech and you can change uh, motor patterns uh, and you can change uh, uh, sometimes even behaviors based on it. Well, how about non-invasive ones? No? Because invasive neurotechnology, whether you want it or not, you have to go through a surgeon. So the entire ethics of medicine applies to it. No? And all the regulations of medical products. Um, so the, the, the patient is protected because it's near invasive neurotechnology is part of medicine. But non-invasive neurotechnology is not part of medicine. In fact, you can buy it as a consumer electronic product. You can order it in Amazon. So these helmets and these devices that are being sold right now, they're not very powerful because, uh, again, but this is, this is improving as the brain initiative in the US and other countries is, is uh, enhancing the development of this new technology, then you could imagine that these devices are going to get better and better. But let me tell you what you can do today with this non-invasive new technology. So there was actually a recently uh, a recent report from a group in Facebook that used uh, EEG and MEG. So these are like helmet-based new technology to decode uh, speech. So this is a breakthrough. I think this is fantastic. I have uh, people that I know that are paralyzed, and uh, if they could wear one of these helmets, they could actually talk to to their family members. No? But again, this alerts the possibility of using these types of EEG recordings and decode them with artificial intelligence of with deep neural networks to extract information about people's uh, thought processes. If you can decode speech, well, maybe you can decode thoughts. Many people f think by mentally talking. And uh, also this year, um, uh, in terms of stimulating neurotechnology, uh, a group uh, in the US reported the use of magnetic stimulation to enhance memory. No? So these are devices that you put next to your brain, but you don't need a surgeon. You can just buy them and, and do it yourself. No? And they uh, report that particular regimes of stimulation can enhance uh, particular types of memories. So this is the beginning of what could become mental augmentation, where you could use neurotechnology to enhance your cognitive abilities. No? Uh, this could happen through what we call a brain-computer interface, okay, that essentially connects the brain to the outside. It could be to a computer, it could be to a to an artificial intelligence uh, system. It could be to a robotic arms, to an avatar. No? So sooner or later, and this is unavoidable because humans have always tried to augment ourselves since we invented the fire and the, and, and the wheel. No? We've, we're always, we're defined by, by this progress and the ability to do things better every, every, with every generation. So sooner or later, we're going to see the use of new technology to enhance memory, to connect ourselves to external uh, uh, memory banks, for example, to to change, to increase our our cognitive processing using artificial intelligence algorithms. So all these things will happen. I don't know when, but I can guarantee you that it will happen. No? Because again, we will have the ability to do that. And this will lead uh, humans to try to improve themselves. Just like uh, we invented the airplane to, to get from one place to another place very quickly. Well, we'll this will be like mental flying. No? We'll use new technology to mentally fly. No? So these things are happening. This is not science fiction. I mean, this report from Facebook decoding uh, speech and these increases in memory using uh, new technology are, have been published this year. So um, because of that, a group of us uh, got together in 2017 
uh, here at Columbia. And we call ourselves the Morningside Group because we met here in the Morningside campus of Columbia University. And this is a group of 25 experts that represented the brain initiatives from all these countries that I measured, that I mentioned. Uh, expert coming from neurotechnology, from the clinic, experts in the law um, and uh, uh, in human rights. And we looked at this issue, at the ethical and societal issues of neurotechnology, and we came to the conclusion that this is a human rights issue. Because again, the brain is not just another organ, it's the organ that generates the mind. And we define ourselves as human because of our mental abilities. So if this is not a human rights issue, what is a human rights issue? This is a technology that goes to the core of what it means to be human. And we propose the idea of new human rights, which we call neural rights to protect brain activity from unwanted uh, use for negative uses of neurotechnology. So specifically, we argue for the right to our own mental privacy so that the content of our mental activity cannot be decoded with our consent. The right to our own agency, to our own free will, so that, so that decisions are made by humans uh, without interfering with new technology into their brain processes. Huh? The right to our own, our own identity. So I told you that uh, we use already in the clinic deep brain stimulation in, in, for instance, for Parkinson's patients. And some of these patients report that whenever you stimulate their brain, their personality changes. Huh? And this is not surprising because the brain generates a personality, generates who you are, your, your consciousness, your identity. So if you interfere with the brain, you're going to interfere with that too. And we think that this should be a basic human right. In fact, it should be the first human right, the right to your own identity, because if you don't have the right to your own identity, why do you need the, the rest of the human rights for now? We also thought that's important uh, to promote uh, the right of equal access to augmentation technology. So as I told you, mental augmentation and cognitive augmentation will happen. It's not going to happen today, but it will happen in the future. I don't know when. And it's very important that before that happens, we set out the rules as to how this technology to augment the human uh, capabilities will be ushered. And we think it should be ushered in society under universal principle of justice. So we were promoting the fair access to uh, neural augmentation. And the final neural right is the right to protection from bias and discrimination in the algorithms that are used in neurotechnology. So neurotechnology and AI go hand in hand. All of this neurotechnology that I'm discussing today has an AI component. AI is necessary to decode uh, brain signals and to also interfere with brain signals. And the minute that you use AI algorithms in the brain, you have the potential for introducing biases that could come with this algorithm directly into the brain of a person. And we think this is much worse than the usual biases that we see with social networks or digital media, because in this case, you're putting the bias directly inside the mind of the person. And we think this should be a, a basic human right protection from biases. So with this agenda of uh, neural rights, um, we set out um, created a foundation, the Neural Rights Foundation, and you can find it in the web. Uh, just type in Neural Rights uh, Foundation and you'll find us. And in the last few years, we are embarking in, uh, in a series of initiatives related to neural rights, to human rights protection against ill-intended uses of neurotechnology. You know? And these have to do with research and in investigating these issues uh, academically, you know, scientifically. Also advocacy, discussing these issues with uh, people in the world uh, that can make things uh, happen, that can change things, either governments, international organizations, no? and also outreach, no? uh, providing this message and this information to society as a whole, and just like I'm doing uh, today with you. No? So the New York Rights Foundation, uh, it's, uh, we've been around for just a few years but we've already had some uh, initiatives with particular countries. So uh, let me just highlight what's happening in Chile. The Republic of Chile has changed its constitution uh, with a constitutional amendment to Article 19 of the Constitution that protects 
brain activity and the information that comes from it as a basic human right. So there is one country in the world, in Chile, where if you're a Chilean citizen, your brain activity and its information is protected by the Constitution. And this is uh, thanks to the work of the Chilean Senate, and we collaborated and helped them providing uh, expertise and, and uh, our work uh, for this um, constitutional amendment. Uh, we're also working with other countries, with Spain, for example, where the, uh, the, um, the Charter of Digital Rights has been uh, announced by the government of Spain, and this Charter of Digital Rights, which is a soft law, it's a series of, of guidelines for future laws, incorporate neural rights in one of their chapters. Now. And we're also working with the United Nations, both uh, in uh, the New York headquarters with the Office of the Secretary General and also in Geneva with the Human Rights Council uh, to explore these issues, particularly with respect of mental privacy, which is maybe the, the issue that's most uh, urgent, I would think, and uh, to, to, to see how we could fit these types of uh, uh, neural rights protection within the existing system of human rights in the UN. No? You know, the UN has a universal declaration of human rights and also has a series of uh, global treaties that are signed by most countries in the world. No? Um, and there's many different types of human rights treaties. And even though they don't cover these neural rights, according to our, our study, you no, know, they're not sufficient, but maybe they can be fixed or they can, you could introduce a special opinion uh, to uh, to provide some type of neural rights protection within the existing treaties. No? And uh, and with this, I wanted to finish uh, with the final comment, like actually a couple of comments. Uh, one is that new technology is actually good. No, I'm very positive about new technology. I'm bullish in spite of these, uh, these potential problems. Uh, this is... Uh, this is the, the way to go, you know, again, for scientific reasons, for medical reasons, just to help these patients, we have to urgently develop new technology, you know, and also for economic reasons. You know. But uh, and I honestly think we're going to be entering a new renaissance because once we understand the brain, we understand ourselves for the first time. You know. um, so uh, in spite of these uh, these warnings, I'm, again, I think I don't want to, to scare you. I think that new technology is something that you should embrace and your country should embrace, no? uh, because it will move humanity forward towards a better future, a, a, a better humanity. No? And the, the final comment is that this human rights approach to the regulation of technology, which in the case of new technology, we think it's obvious. Again, if this is not a human rights issue, interfering with your brain activity, what is a human rights issue? No? But uh, the same recipe could be used to other technologies. And I'm thinking here, of technologies such as AI, you know, uh, surveillance uh, technologies, robotics, social networks, the metaverse, even genetic engineering. You know. uh, governments have tried to regulate these technologies with specific laws and guidelines, and they mostly have failed. In case of the digital technologies, AI is one example. You know. um, relying on the industry self-regulation just doesn't work it's not in the, the purpose in the bones of the industry to self-regulate no. but maybe providing a human rights approach uh, could be a good solution not just for new technology but for all these other technologies because it's a global framework and that would help uh, uh, equilibrate again the situation across all countries no and it's also hard law it's not soft law. I mean, human rights treaties have real consequences, have sanctions, and can end up uh, with people in jail if they uh, if they break the, the human rights. And so, so we think it's actually, um, it is uh, it is an appropriate uh, answer to these challenges of the world that we're living in with all these disruptive technologies. And in a way, a human rights framework defines what type of human being we want to be. So, so this is my proposal to you. Let's think about the future. Let's define what type of human being we want to be. Let's codify this in the human rights, and then let's develop whatever technology we want as long as it fits this idea of, of uh, what type of humans that we want to be. Thank you.